this bag is filled with mushrooms this bag is filled with mushrooms this is mushrooms this is filled with mushrooms and i think that's still filled with mushrooms i think we're stocked how was our day mushroom hunting really good <laughs> we killed it today guys yeah. good job everybody fall mushroom hunting it's a tradition in our household one that i'm glad to say the kids really enjoy doing with the family it seems getting out into the woods and with the crunching leaves and getting out before the cold wind blows it's like a last ditch chance to spend some time together away from the screens and school and homework and it's something once you get the kids out there they really engage with I think having the opportunity to find a giant mushroom that they get to take out that's the size of their head it leaves a pretty strong impression one that they'll never forget if you're looking for a great way to spend quality time with your kids or just want to get out of the house and learn something new for your own health and benefit i want to share with you in this video what i believe are the five must know fall mushrooms these mushrooms are not only safe and easy to find in large quantity but they are absolutely delicious and will taste like nothing you've ever had before <laughs> i'm a happy guy right now what do you think we should call these what, right. do we, what do we got it what do we got it down to so since we're gonna turn them into uh to uh marshmallows and since they're cold our first mushroom on the list today chicken of the woods also commonly known as the sulfur shelf mushroom, this mushroom is easily recognized for the orangish red color on its top. It belongs to the genus Latipris, and though there's an ever growing number of species in that genus, the good news is none of them are poisonous. Though an important note, a small percentage of people may be allergic to any given mushroom. Hence, all mushrooms should be consumed in small quantity when trying them for the first time. They will be found growing on stumps, tree trunks, and the fallen logs of deciduous or coniferous trees. Occasionally they may be found on living trees, but most commonly on dead wood. It also may occasionally grow from dead underground roots, giving it the appearance of coming from the ground. Though some can be found in late spring and summer, the vast majority will be found starting shortly after the peak heat of summer has passed and lasting until the first frost. The mushroom can be absolutely gigantic in size, with record specimens approaching 100 pounds. However, for the table, small, clean, fresh young specimens are most desired. I frequently harvest 30 pounds or more from a single trip to the woods in the fall. For cooking, it is best used as a meat substitute and can easily fulfill the role of chicken or pork in any recipe. In my experience, it is most important to keep it moist while cooking. If it becomes dry during the cooking process, the end result will be much less enjoyable. Chicken mushroom fajitas are my personal favorite way to cook this mushroom. I did a video about a year ago making chicken mushroom fajitas. If you'd like to see that, I'll put a link in the descriptions. It's a pretty fun video. Now one other key note on identification of this mushroom is the bottom side will either be a sulfur yellow or white, depending on the species. I'm gonna show you a quick clip from a video I did on that uh, about a year ago. Now we do have both Latipris sulfurus and Latipris cincinnatus here. So we're gonna can them separately so that we can sort of detect to see if there's any difference in the quality of the end result based on that. But this is the Latipris sulfurus. It has the same orange top, but the bottom is sulfur yellow. Latipra cincinnatus, same orange top, but the bottom is white. It's the only real difference. I find that this one with the white bottom seems to be texture-wise a little bit drier and a little bit crumblier. And to find that the, this variety tends to peel a little better, the Latipra sulfurus, and uh, the cincinnatus usually kind of comes apart in chunks as opposed to peeling. Really the only differences I see in the two though. They're both wonderful. Shroom time. Puffballs. Puffball is a term used to describe a large group of mushrooms that produce spores internally. Hence, they will have no caps or gills. Most of us will have at some point at least remember one time in our childhood kicking a giant puffball and watching it obliterate into a million pieces. So for beginners, I recommend focusing on two different kinds of puffball. The giant puffball, Calvatia gigantea, that usually grows in pastures, prairies, lawns, and hillsides. And the pear-shaped puffball, Epioperdon piriformi. Eh, I give it my best. 
These grow in huge colonies on well-decayed logs, usually found deeper in the woods. Each of these mushrooms should have pure white tissue on the inside when picking for consumption. Each can be found depending on conditions throughout the fall season. Now this mushroom does have a potentially dangerous look like that needs to be mentioned. Some guild mushrooms start off in a button stage that could resemble a newly emerging puffball. Basically, it's a tiny egg that forms before the mushroom's fruiting body emerges out of the egg. But rest easy, there's a simple, safe, and easy test to ensure proper identification. Cut the mushroom in half vertically. If you see an outline of a mushroom inside, it should be discarded. It is a button stage of a mushroom, and could potentially be very dangerous as some Amanita mushrooms begin life this way. If the tissue is all white with no structure or shape forming, then it's a puffball, and you're good to go. Also note this is only a concern if collecting small puffballs of a few inches in diameter or smaller, as the only look-alike for the larger puffballs is a volleyball. Wilson! For consumption, each of these mushrooms is incredibly versatile. Pear-shaped puffballs go well in stir-fries or spicy sauces, while the giant puffball can be buttered with a little salt and pepper and then grilled to taste an awful lot like a steak. Okay, well a tofu steak, but it's still pretty good, seriously. Also, surprisingly, puffballs can be canned for preservation. Something I may do a video on at some point in the future. Now I'd like to share a quick clip from a video I took about a year ago illustrating exactly how to analyze the puffballs for quality of edibility and safety. That could mean that they're decaying if they're not white, in which case you wouldn't want them, and that's what's going on here. These are brown, and they're just getting old. Or, if you were to see the shape of a mushroom outline inside the puffball, that would be a sign that it's not a puffball at all, and that it is a button stage of a different type of mushroom. Now, I've never seen that happening on a log. Generally, you'll see those types of mushrooms that have a button stage that resembles a puffball. You'll see those growing in logs. So here's a good batch, and this is what you want it to look like when you cut into it. Pure white tissue. So we'll go and harvest these guys. These are nice. So next mushroom up, Hen of the Woods. Now this is a really special mushroom for me. I've got an interesting story. 12 years ago, my neighbor gave me a bag of pickled mushrooms. All I knew about them was that they were from a friend of his mother's and she had found them and pickled them. And he gave them to me. Now over the course of about a six week period, I munched on these mushrooms and got more and more fond of them as time passed. And when I asked him what they were, he said they were Claudines. So I read and read and read to try to find Claudine mushrooms, which you won't find a synonym for them anywhere on the internet. But eventually, as I evolved my mushroom hunting skills, I learned about the maitake mushroom. And as soon as I harvested my first one, I realized that was my Claudine. It took three years, but eventually I had it. I had the Claudine mushroom, and for some reason the folks in Clinton, Indiana to this day still refer to them as Claudines, and as far as I know, it's the only place in America that they do so. Now that I had my mushroom though, I pickled, dehydrated, fried, canned, fricasseed, and everything else I could this mushroom, and I've loved every single way I've ever cooked it. My favorite dish to serve this in is turkey stuffing for Thanksgiving dinner. I find its texture and flavor just lends itself perfectly to the savory seasonings and juices in a turkey. As for when to harvest this mushroom, start paying attention to when the nights get really cold. I generally find within two to four weeks of the first hard frost, either before it or after it, is when I'll find the maitakes are popping. So since they tend to grow on oak trees, if you can find an established hardwood oak forest, that's the best place to start looking. Now the good news about maitakes is once you find them, you're gonna always know where they are. They do tend to come back year after year on the same trees but sometimes you have to invest a lot of effort into finding your first one. I recommend when you're getting close to the first frost of the year, start getting into the woods about once a week. That'll help you keep an eye on when the maitakes will pop because when one pops, they will all pop at the same time and you will have your harvest. But you do have to get there at the right time because sometimes if the weather warms up, they may decay quickly. By the way, when I go hen hunting, it's the only time I keep a wheelbarrow in my truck just in case. There are a few lookalikes for this mushroom, but the good news is they're all edible too. Berkeley's polypore and black standing polypore are the two I most common see mixed up. And again, they're both edible. So this is what it looks like on the bottom. See each of those fronds, they, it's, it's a polypore mushroom, which means it doesn't have gills underneath. It has tiny little pores and you have to look real close to see the pores. It almost looks like hairs on the bottom. Um, 
uh, with the naked eye, but if you were to look through a microscope, you could easily see the, the pores. Now, mushrooming pro tip, put clean mushrooms in your bag. Every bit of dirt that's on here, it'll be all over it, evenly spread over every mushroom in your bag if you stick them in like this. So get as much dirt and bad stuff off of them before you put them in the bag as you can. And you are gonna make your life a lot easier when you get back home with them. Oyster mushrooms, sometimes commonly referred to simply as tree mushrooms, belong to the genus Pleurotus. Though there are many species in the genus, Pleurotus ostriatus, at least in the Midwest United States, represents the vast majority of the population. This mushroom is widely consumed and cultivated. The color of this mushroom will change with the seasons, being more white and flat during the summer months, and gray or tan with more of a rounded shape during the winter months. It is a delicate mushroom with a high moisture content. It grows directly from dead or dying wood and will frequently be found growing in vertical bands on standing timber. It consumes most deciduous hardwoods, but it especially likes the wood of aspen and willow trees. I consider this mushroom to be the workhorse of all wild mushroom collection, as it can be found in all four seasons when the conditions are favorable. Winter is actually one of the better times for collecting this mushroom, with spring being the least desirable. Its flavor is mild and pleasant. It can be sauteed in butter, breaded and fried, added to a sauce, eaten fresh on a pizza, or preserved by dehydrating. Of all the wild mushrooms available, none will so thoroughly feed a person on a regular basis as will the oyster mushroom. To help in identification of this mushroom, ensure the gills are close together and descend the stalk. The stalk itself will be offset to one side. There is one poisonous lookalike worth noting. The jack-o'-lantern mushroom resembles the oyster mushroom in almost every way, including having gills that descend the stalk. It, however, does not resemble the oyster in color, making distinguishing them incredibly easy. Jack-o'-lanterns are vibrant orange in color. If ingested, jack-o'-lanterns will cause extreme gastric upset, so should not be consumed. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't be collected. You see, jacks glow in the dark. So it can make a fun experiment to take some home and place them in a dark room to see if you can see them glow. I've had mixed results myself with this experiment. As for flavor in mushrooms, there's one that stands tall above all the others. It's a little less common than the other mushrooms on this list, but if you're gonna be in the woods, you need to be watching out for this mushroom. It is unique. There is no look-alike that a reasonable person could confuse with it. And I'm talking about lion's mane. Well, the entire genus Heresium, actually. In the U.S., there are three main species commonly found within this genus. Lion's mane, bear's head tooth, and comb tooth are the common names. I've only had the pleasure of finding two of these, but I can say with confidence that the bear's head tooth is the best mushroom I have ever had in my life. The lion's mane is a close second. Sorry, Morels. They have a sponge-like fruiting body that in some form or another will produce icicle-like structures flowing downwards, like a beard or a lion's mane, hence the common names. They grow from decaying wood and will sometimes be found high up in living trees. They do this just to give grown adults a reason to climb trees. As for cooking, all of the members of this genus have similar flavor profiles. And get this, they taste like lobster or crab or some point in between. Now it has a spongy consistency. You can actually squeeze these mushrooms so the mushrooms will soak up the flavor of whatever they are cooked in. Better than real lobster or crab will ever do. It's the best mushroom I've ever had in my life. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know in the comments. I'd also be curious to hear how some other people cook and use some of these mushrooms. And I do truly hope that maybe this video helps some folks decide to get out in the woods and enjoy the outdoors. Thanks for watching Reliably Random Outdoors. Have a great day. Um, I mean, there's one cluster of two mushrooms, like another six or eight inches. Uh, I'm gonna have to leave that one. Oh, God.